In the rolling hills of the Scottish Highlands, something special is happening. Just outside of Stirling in the borough of Dune lies Argety, a farm estate whose name originally meant Windy Height. Argety is a fully functioning farm. It raises crops such as cereal grains and grasses, as well as livestock such as lambs and cows. However, it is home to some unique revenue streams as well, such as a motocross track and something unexpected. Argety is host to Central Scotland's only red kite feeding station, from which spectators can photograph these endangered birds. Argety is assisted in this by the Scottish Rural Development Programme, or SRDP, which is aimed at encouraging wildlife. Argety's head park ranger, Mike McDonnell, shares a little of the farm's history and geography. The farm's about 1,400 acres in size and it was first bought by the, the Bowser family in, in 1916 so it's been in the same family ever since. Uh, the farm used to be quite a lot bigger than it is currently. The farm is about 1,400 acres. Just over in the dip, that's the viewing height, that's where we view the kites from. So that's about the halfway point. Northern part of the the farm is unimproved pasture, so we've got most of the sheep up there at the moment. All these sheep here have got the, the single lambs. Uh, on the improved pasture further down to the south of the of the hide, we have um, improved grazing, so we've got all the lambs down there. Both twins um, and triplets are down there. We've got the Fintry Hills and the Gorgunnock Hills, and this is a, a stretch which goes called the Campsie Fells. If, on a straight line that way would lead uh, down to down to Glasgow. In the viewing blind, Mike explains to visitors the preservation process, which includes feeding and tagging the birds. One of the really important things with the with the birds, obviously, because they're wild birds. The last thing you want to do is to form a dependency now. There's quite a few different feeding sites around Britain. Um, and some of them, I think, personally, just put a little bit too much food out. There's a site in Wales which are putting out, you know, 70, 80 kilos of food a day, which I really don't agree with. I mean, we literally put out about the weight of a rabbit, maybe a rabbit and a half, so very small amount of food. And the whole idea is that, fingers crossed, um, you guys get close views of the birds rather than for them to become fat, lazy, independent. So it's a small amount of food. Sometimes they slam down within minutes. If you've not seen kites, this is the actual size. So about five foot, five and a half foot wingspan, so big old birds. And when you think to the kites, sorry to that off, when you think to the kites in the past, because they're so big, because they've got hooked beaks, because they've got hooked talons, people were just presuming they could kill things like pheasant, grouse, um, people thought they killed lambs. Believe it or not, people actually thought kites killed full-grown sheep. Now, Neil and Tom are working with the sheep just now at the back of us, so you can hear all that racket. We finished lambing about three weeks ago. And you know, when you're wrestling with the sheep and handling them, you realise, you know, they're heavy, they're heavy things. I mean, your average sheep is about six and a half, seven stone. If you think a male kite weighs 800 grams, mm. a female kite's about 1,200 grams, so something weighing the same as two tins of baked beans or a bag of sugar isn't able to catch anything bigger than like little voles, mice, frogs, uh, that kind of size thing. Females at a push could manage to take maybe a baby rabbit, but that's about the maximum um, they can handle. The rest of their food is is scavenged. Now because of that, people would see kites eating a, you know, a dead lamb or a dead pheasant and just see the, the sheer size of it and presume, you know, they must have killed it for themselves when in reality, They've come across it when it's when it's already dead. So um, it was a true misunderstanding as to what caused their demise. But what happened really, and it's quite a unique situation for Britain, was during the Victorian Victorian period, and the Victorians were a funny old bunch, <coughs> and you know a massive increase in in driven grouse shooting and pheasant shooting, and really didn't matter what it was, any predator, any bird of prey, in fact anything that ate meat was on the vermin records. Now, kites were killed by the hundred, golden eagle by the hundred, you know, 
if you look at the old documents, it's enough to make you weep, it's really depressing. Um, and because of that, and because kites aren't particularly frightened of people, the fact they group up in the winter and they scream their heads off, they're really quite easy targets. Back in November, I had 49 kites, that's my, that's my personal best. And if you imagine the decibel level you'd hear from 49 kites, it's, it's quite a lot. And, um, you know, if you think to the past, groups of kites would consist of maybe 300, 400 birds. And, you know, you can imagine it was so easy to get rid of uh, in vast numbers. Now, I've got an old um, gamekeeper's diary for up the road in Calendar, which isn't too far away from here. And it showed just in one year, between December 1824 and December 1825, on one single shooting estate, they killed 105 kites. Now that was happening at every single shooting estate across Scotland and across all of Britain. So you can see why they became extinct um, fairly rapidly. I mean, you're looking at completely gone from England, uh, sorry, from Scotland about 1879, 1880, about a decade before that gone from England, and a low point, five pairs in Wales, and that was it. So if you imagine 10 kites in all of Britain, it's fairly scary. So what's happened with the range reduction? Uh, the reintroduction started in 1989 and this site here is one of the first three sites and we're quite lucky because of that because ourselves, the Black Isle up north and the Chilterns down south are the first three sites and the birds have actually brought in from Europe so the ones we got here are from um, Germany originally the ones up north are from Sweden and the ones down south are from Spain the later seven release sites what's happened is we've kind of selected a few chicks from different areas, mixed them, matched them and released them into new sites. So as it stands there are 10 sites, they're all spreading out, they're all doing well but in the future you know there could be 11, 12, 13 sites. There was a brand new site started last year down in Cumbria at Grisdale Forest so eventually fingers crossed we'll have kites throughout Britain again as it, as it should be but you know for the time being we've got the 10 populations and they're, they're doing well. I mean last year we covered about a 45 mile distance, we pinned down 54 nests and we ringed and tagged 93 chicks in total. To put that in perspective, we had the first five chicks hatch on the farm in 1998 and that year we had five chicks. So just 12 years later we've gone from five chicks to 93 chicks. I was expecting this year to have tri tri go into triple figures for the first time, but because of the storms we had, uh, we've lost quite a few nests and I'm not expecting miracles for this year. but. You know, the weather can't be helped, it's just one of those things, but generally it has been a, you know, a real success to, to get these birds back. So I'll go and pop this little bit of food out and um, hopefully they'll, they'll, they'll show you why they're so special, you know. <laughs> I, I came here originally just on a six month contract with the RSPB um, back in 2003 and I'm still here. I've got, I've got the kite bug, I absolutely love them. <laughs> but it's been quite nice to see it develop, you know, from, from the beginning. Um, and as I say, the, the, the pretty special birds. And just, just on Sunday there, we've started to tag this year's, this year's chicks. So we've had the first few chicks um, ringed and tagged. And I'll explain more about the tagging when I come back in, but I'll just go and um, pop this food out now. Right, right, safe, safe, safe battery. So I mentioned on Sunday we started tagging. These are the, the actual tags that we fit to the birds. Now how the system works is the... Um, there's a loose flap of skin just between the sort of elbow and the shoulder and just like getting your ear pierced um, through this plastic through the, the fold of skin twist of the wire and that will stay with the bird for life the left the left tag is a color of where they're from so each of the 10 sites in britain have their own color so all the ones are going to hear are red north scotland's blue south scotland's green so that tells you where, where they're from on the left on the left wing Colour on the right wing is a colour for the year, so blue, 93 chicks last year were all blue, so 2010 was blue, all this year's chicks are white, so left tag is where you're from and right tag is how old you are. And this is how we know birds are moving, so at the moment we've got birds breeding here from North Scotland, from South Scotland, and we've actually got a bird breeding here from, from Yorkshire, from Harewood House in North Yorkshire, so they are mixing and matching, which is really important for the genetics, um, so inevitably as the population increases, it's going to be more and more difficult to get them all tagged. The problem we have really is a limitation of 50, 50 plus pairs is getting difficult because they're going from an egg not much bigger than that of a chicken 
to five and a half foot wingspan and it only takes them seven weeks. So these tags only be fitted when the birds are about four and a half, five weeks old. So it boils down about a week and a half, two weeks maximum to get around 54 nests.